Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 590. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger, and today is April 15th, 2020. All right, welcome to another program. Before we get started, please like, subscribe, comment, share the program. Uh, what else? Oh, we have a podcast. It's in the show notes. There, nice, simple. I kept it under 15 seconds. People can stop complaining about Kevin taking so long to advertise and promote the program. But somebody should, because I don't see you guys doing it. That's not true. You guys really like and comment a lot. You know, I'm talking more about the comments that I did last time. Ah, all right, let me stop. Okay, you're looking at your screens. You see George. You see Kevin. You don't see Gavin. What happened? Oh, the stories. Okay, so uh, when Gavin joined the Roman Catholic Church a couple months ago, he called me and left a message on WhatsApp and said, Kevin, I've joined the Roman Catholic Church, and um, it's not going to work for the program. Um, I, you know, If you want, I'll quit. Uh, unless you can think of something else. I said, oh, don't quit. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, we need you. You're great. Um, you offer a great perspective. And we, we kind of tried to work it out. You know, we didn't want too much tension on the studio, but we wanted to be good representation to the audience. And so I convinced Gavin to stay. And we had fun. And it worked out. But over time, it was getting more and more tense in the studio uh, with George, Gavin, and I, because in reality, he was a uh, numero Catholic and he was loving everything he saw and read. And he, this was becoming kind of the apologetic show for his newfound Roman Catholic faith, which made it difficult because George and I are not here to debate <laughs> Gavin. And we're starting to get more and more uh, people in the comments saying, you know, guys, he's, he's giving you softballs. You could have said this. You could have said that. Why aren't you guys uh, counterpointing Gavin's claims? And I, there was the week, uh, the, the show we were going to do in Holy Week. We sat down and we did a show and it got tense and everybody uh, basically laid an egg and we didn't record. We didn't put it out and we left angrily. That's life, guys. And we kind of made the decision that we really not going to go on Anglican Unscripted with Gavin. We may have another outlet sometime in the future, an unscripted program that's not in the Anglican fashion where Gavin will be part of it. But um, I, I need to be honest with you guys. It, it, it just became more and more and more tense. Of all the great human beings on the earth that I know and have met in all my travels, Gavin's one of them. Uh, and Gavin has proven one thing certain. Three heads on this show are better than two, as you'll probably find out by the end of this episode. Um, it, he was an amazing counterpoint uh, uh, to what we were talking about. His mastery of cultural Marxism and Church of England and church politics, you know, certainly wonderful and helped the show a lot. He helped grow our audience we're going to obviously take a cut in the audience, but we also want to be faithful to our audience as well. And, you know, I, I've been told a million times, it's Anglican unscripted. Why on earth do you have George on there? Well, George is an Anglican. He's an Episcopal Anglican. Then why do you have Gavin? Well, all right. Well, I, I can't really defend that. But, you know, here we are. We find ourselves once again after four years we had Gavin, three years. It's two talking heads, George and Kevin giving you the Anglican news and the Christian perspective on what's going on in the world. Um, what we're going to miss, Gavin George? Yes, indeed. It was a fun ride, uh, but all things uh, grow at their own pace and at their own time. And we've now reached uh, a time when we need to basically, where are we and where are we going and what do we really want to do? Do we want to be a uh, so, do you remember the old CNN show, A Crossfire, of uh, left and right battling it out? Or do we want to be uh, a uh, an Anglican news and views show? Mm -hmm. And we tried our best to hold it together, but and looked to what was uniting and was common 
uh, to all views. Uh, but then there are times when things just got too uh, divisive to really serve our true purpose. And um, our brand is not argumentation. Um, no, it's not. not a- neither Kevin or I are orators. We don't. <laughs> we're not well, forensic uh, scholars where we can, you know, debate I, and play one-upmanship. I absolutely agree, and that's the hardest part is that type of tension where somebody says something and you disagree with it. But if you're going to disagree with them, I, this isn't the platform for that. This do, that type of theological disagreement doesn't work well in an unscripted fashion in crosstalk or crossfire from CNN, it was perfect. Because you would walk on there to what, just to turn on CNN at the time, I put deodorant on because I was gonna sweat it out watching it. I don't want people to sweat it out watching Anglican Unscripted. And you know, we've all come to this you know, understanding that um, that will not work in this format. This is about news, it's about analyzing the news, it's about analyzing the news from a Christian perspective. It's not about defending um, Marian aberrations. It, it just isn't. Is Gavin to blame? No. Gavin's on a journey, a faith journey. It just, his journey isn't working in this format for this show. Is George to blame? No, because, you know, it, it was something that was uh, tense in this format. Is Kevin to blame? Well, yes, the buck stops here. I'm the producer. I make the final calls on uh, format, editing, what's in the show, what's out of the show. So if anybody out there wants to blame anybody, uh, my email's in in the show notes. Oh, be gentle, well, though. <laughs> K- Kevin, I, I think we need to actually put the blame where it truly lies, and that's with Catherine Jefford Shorey. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Of course, <laughs> you know. I mean, we can always go back to the 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 thing that made this show take off was her leadership of the Episcopal Church, and we could always, without fail, find fault in whatever she was doing. Those were the good old days. I, you know, when I wake up in the morning, I do miss her leadership in the Episcopal Church. I'm like, oh, it's gonna be a low content day. So, uh, please understand, we love Gavin. Um, that he helped make the show what it is, but it's just it, it's time, and I think the three of us know it, and the three of us are in agreement. I do hope to do something uh, else down the road with Gavin. Um, it, it would be wonderful to do some. We could just do four hours on cultural Marxism. Yeah, it it, it would be wonderful. Good, let's move on to today's news. Uh, we're just out of Holy Week. Generally, if you've watched this program a lot, you know that. Uh, Anglican Unscripted is not taped during Holy Week. George is busy. I'm busy. The last thing I want to do is worry about content. Yet a lot of stuff happens over Holy Week, especially when there's a pandemic slowly crossing the world. You know, zombies are popping out of graves. Well, that didn't happen yet. And so it's fun to watch the church respond to a pandemic, including Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, who said, um, listen, don't use the churches. The Church of England churches need to be closed in respect for uh, all the other non-essential things going on in England. And I'm like, well, that's going to be a wonderful topic when we get back after Holy Week. Uh, George, give us uh, what happened and give us the update. Well, back in March, uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson asked Uh, non-essential enterprises, businesses, clubs, groups, not to allow, not to have gatherings of more than 10 people. And the archbishops of Canterbury and York followed upon this and said, okay, folks, we're going to close the churches. So we don't want people gathering. And we want to set a good example to the nation uh, that our example will be staying at home but you're allowed to go in, the clergy are allowed to go in and make films and do church remotely, virtually. Then that transformed it. Basically, you could film your liturgy. You could have morning prayer, evening prayer, whatever. You could have uh, Eucharist, you could do it, but it had to be on camera. Well, in Britain, the COVID-19 situation worsened and the government uh, imposed stricter and stricter guidelines. And we've all seen the little news stories of uh, policemen harassing little old ladies walking their dogs or dyeing a lake uh, black 
that was picturesque that people would like to take walks at and look at, and they dyed it black so it would be ugly and people wouldn't come. Well, at, just as the government in England began its overreach in its crackdown on COVID-19 socialization, the Church of England did as well. Justin Welby and Johnson Tamu put out a letter about the third week of March saying, we do not want clergy, even if they live next door to their churches, going in to live stream. You may not go in. And this was interpreted by the bishops of the Church of England as an order. For example, on March 23rd, the Bishop of Rochester uh, sent out a letter explaining, here's the Archbishop's policy, and I expect everybody to obey this. And if you do not, this will be a disciplinary matter. Wow. So you could, even if you, even if the back door of your garden opened up into the church, you could still, you still could not go and do worship in your church, either privately or you couldn't go there to do live streaming or videotaping or anything. You could only do it from your home if you were going to do it. And then Justin Welby began to do these, oh, I hate to be unkind, God awful kitchen so kitchen table services yeah where he's there in a rumpled shirt and a, he always has this rumpled shirt and the collar a little too far out okay justin welby has a dilbert collar don't go teasing him okay <laughs> and basically i liken it to politicians going uh, well, let's go to the Polish neighborhood today and have kielbasa and pierogies. And then for after lunch, we'll go to the Mexican neighborhood, put on a sombrero and eat tacos. It was just such a, a pandering. The man has a chapel in his house. A beautiful chapel. A beautiful chapel in his 14th century house. Okay. It's called Lambeth Palace. And he could have filmed from the chapel. But no, he filmed from the kitchen. Well, well he, so this was... If you will, it's akin to the governor of Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer, I think. Yes, I'm you know, right. for, forbidding people from buying garden seed at Home Depot. Uh, you could go to Target and you could buy groceries, but the garden aisle was locked down because gardening supplies are non-essential. It was that level of silliness. Well, here's the good news: the clergy of the Church of England revolted, yeah. left and right. This past weekend, we saw in the Telegraph and in the Times stories about clergy, both liberal and conservative, saying, uh-uh, Justin Welby, you do not have the legal authority to ban me from celebrating worship in my church because the church law says I must celebrate every Sunday, no matter what. There's no health and safety uh, walk back. No, that's good. And then on, so on Sunday, mm. Justin Welby appeared after he has a terrific clubbing in the press for introducing these things and the Telegraph and the Times in particular and the Daily Mail had articles lauding these priests who were fighting injustice by opening their churches to prayer. Justin Welby appears on the Andrew Marr show on TV in Britain and says, well, these were just suggestions. They weren't orders. That's sweet. Now, nobody seemed to have told the Archbishop of Rochester at the time that this was a suggestion because he was saying, if you disobey, you're going to get the chop. So here's the, the, the great news is there's a spine beginning to form within the clergy of England. And that's, I wish that spine would form here in the Episcopal Church, but kudos. A friend of this show, James Pace, was one of the clergy profiled in the Telegraph story and how, you know, England is a conformist society, much more so the United States. And to take this step of fighting the power is a remarkable, remarkable achievement. Congratulations, James, and to all the others who spoke out and spoke out. Well, especially with the threat of uh, repercussions, I mean... England has a vast history of repercussions towards clergy. And, I, you know, I, I'm glad they were able to overcome that. Nobody got burned at the stake. Nobody got slain in Canterbury. So, you know, good times. And, and it's nice to see that the, uh, the Church of England is finally developing a bit of a backbone. Now, do, do you, Kevin, do you remember? Uh, Melvin Tinker has been a guest on this show a number sure. of times. And he writes uh, opinion pieces for Anglican Inc., and he had a wonderful piece that was one of the top hits of last week. 
we're basically saying this abdication of responsibility and of leadership by the Archbishops of Canterbury and York, it's bad enough that they should go. It's really that bad because it's like telling the troops, you should, instead of protecting the civilians, you should hide in the houses with them to set a good example of hiding with your head under the sand. How did the how did the church in the time of martyrdom behave? How did the church behave during times of plague and epidemic and cholera? Even in the Episcopal Church, we have the martyrs of Memphis. There were nuns, Episcopal nuns, who tended those who were suffering from cholera. Uh, this is cool. I, they I'm died. Let, let, let the uh, audience see our website called Anglican Inc. This is the uh, article that George is talking about with Melvin Tinker. Nice. Could you screen? She, I took that photo of Welby at All Saints Cathedral. Uh -huh. That's when he caught sight of Kevin and myself. He doesn't like us. I don't know why. We're perfectly sweet and kind, yeah, and we I, brush our teeth and everything. But that's the face he made when he saw Kevin. Then he turned on me. <laughs> so if you get a chance, if you haven't read it yet, head on over to uh, uh, Anglican Inc. and you can uh, read it there. It's it's linked on the front page. Um, ooh, let's see if my trades are going well. Um, so a lot has happened, uh, obviously, in the last four weeks. And I want to get back to show notes here so I don't uh, lose my place. And the biggest thing that's happened is the church has been forced to live stream, have been forced to make a choice. Close your doors, stay closed, uh, face ruin, um, or buy a camera, buy a capture card, hook it up to your computer, and live stream and for the most part around the world regardless of social class churches have done it i have not seen uh, i can think of maybe three or four churches uh locally here who were not, not able to do it but i am so impressed this really is to me the big takeaway uh from this whole COVID 19 thing Yes, we may have a massive recession. Yes, things may fall apart economically. And yes, we may get another wave of sickness in the summer. That's all true. But from a church life, what I'm seeing is that the vast majority, let me say 98% of the churches that I'm aware of, stepped up to the plate and did something. They displayed an entrepreneurial spirit. Now, of course, some churches did a have done a better job uh, last week, I think we talked about an ACNA church in uh, West Virginia, a uh, relatively small church, and how all of a sudden their internet web presence is more, it's massive, and it's more, more polished and more professional than some of the suburban churches in Washington, D.C. that, in essence, are their competition. We're seeing, how, you know, uh, Donald Trump likes to use a phrase, shake in the box, you know, here are all the variables. I don't like them. Let's shake the box and see what what new die, what the die come up with this time. Yahtzee? Is that what we're talking about? <laughs> Could be Yahtzee. <laughs> Could be Yahtzee. But well, the I... but the but with that in in this crisis and chaos, there's opportunity, and some mm -hmm. churches, many churches, are seizing this opportunity, and it's really encouraging. It is. Let me mute my watch. I'm, I apologize for this. It, it is because I'm going to tell you right now, people. How's your Amazon stock doing, Kevin? Oh, it's is it? I love it. I mean, I should, <laughs> it went down to sixteen eighty, and I started buying, buying, buying. And now it's up to twenty one or something. It's sixteen dollars and eighty cents or uh, sixteen hundred eighty. Uh, uh, this okay. is Amazon. They don't they don't divide their stock at all. They're they're a higher class stock. Um, but the the church was asked to step up to the plate, and I'm going to tell you this. I don't know. I can think of maybe half a dozen, maybe a dozen people with a theological degree that are really tech savvy. That when this occurred, they're like, yeah. Most of the clergy I know were a little fearful, a little uncertain, a little like, <laughs> what do I do now? And so I put up the live stream. Are you stream. talking about me? <laughs> yes. I put up the live stream of how to live stream. And it's interesting to see how the clergy have said, you know, made this now a fundamental part of their worship. They don't just do Sunday. They don't just set up and do their, their live shot of the Eucharist and stuff like that. They're doing morning prayer. 
They're doing afternoon, noonday prayer. They're doing evening prayer. I see some people doing Compline. And I'm like, yeah, please. Now that you've learned to work and operate and worship in the virtual world, don't think that you need to stop when uh, society goes back to normal. You have been given an amazing opportunity to grow your church in a virtual way. Yeah. And we're figuring out how to do this. I, I have a, every Wednesday, I have a healing service in our chapel at my little church. And we'll get 10 from six in the summer to 12 or 15 in the winter coming every Wednesday for the hour and a half. I did it this morning online with just Susan, my wife and myself. And those 12 people all tuned in plus 200 others who, uh, and I don't know if they were there for three seconds or if they were there for the entire hour. Uh, Cause I was on, I couldn't monitor the stats while I was doing the show. I hate to say it that way. Doing no, the no, show. no, no. I could show you how, but <laughs> yeah, we were doing the gig at church and I couldn't tell, you know, I understand. But what, what's that? And the thing, the P and the comments that I read after the, sh after the service were that people from far away who have no real connectedness to my congregation, but either friends of mine or friends of friends or somebody sent them a link participated in that worshiping life. We've been doing like most churches, we've been doing things on Sunday morning. And my senior warden, in other words, this is the lady who really needs to have the interest of the church at heart, my church at heart. She watches our live stream. She's from South Carolina originally. She watches her old church in South Carolina's live stream. And then she looks and watches on replay some other churches. So in other words, she is going from saying two hours in, on a Sunday morning in my church to three hours to churches all across the country. It's almost like she's in a Chinese restaurant. She's taking something from column A. She likes my preaching. She loves the music of her old, old St. Andrews, I think it is in Charleston. She loves the music there. And she loves, you know, something else from this other aspect. This is not threatening, I think, no. to me, because no. I'm never going to have a music program like that church up north. But what it does is it allows for the fullness and the development of faith. So it's not that we're competing with each other when we do this, but rather I think that we're building upon each other's strengths. And this is an opportunity to really reclaim the world for Jesus Christ. I go to Church of the Apostles here in Bridgeport, uh, Connecticut, and our priest does something uh, that I think is really important during the time of giving. He says, listen, a lot of people are guests out there and we're doing our, our time where we're going to collect money from our members. We don't want your money. Okay, and listen send, to the music. Send it, send, send send it, it to send George. It listen to the music. Listen to the offertory music and stuff like that. This is the time where the members of this church click on this link and you know give their tithes and, and stuff like that and he really wants to you know if you want to join the church that's different but we're not televangelist we're not out there uh begging for money to make ends meet that we function as a church even though we're doing this in a virtual world and and it works two ways um one of our viewers on this show is a man named jim hogg he and his wife linda and they have a teenage son who's an accomplished musician, James Hawk. Well, the James, they'd sent me some CDs their son had made, uh, and I was listening to them, and I thought, you know, these would be great accompaniment music to my services. And I don't have to pay royalties to anybody, and Facebook and YouTube won't slam me for copyright violations. So I asked, may I use some of your music for the service? They said, we'd love you if you, if you could do that. And so at the end of my service, I have music performed by James Linden Hogg, and here's his website if you want to see more of his stuff. But here's, here's a young man in Louisiana providing the music. To, uh, you know, he played the doxology on his violin and in our Eucharist service on Sunday. It's uh, uh, this morning. It's just uh, powerful, the gifts that, social, that the, this social interaction can provide. And here's what happened in 2020 during a pandemic, the church stood up and they took back the internet from porn. They took it back from Netflix. They stood up and said, we can be a presence here. We can be a virtual presence offering worship, offering all these skills that we have 
uh, in a place we've never been before. This is the this is the ground you got. Oh, I live in Connecticut. The ground is really hard. Well, the internet's not that hard. You know, Anglican TV has been on the internet for, for 10 years and people have been clamoring for your messages and clamoring to hear more about Jesus. And now they have that opportunity. You took a pandemic, but welcome to the internet. Don't leave. Don't Kevin, for a minute leave. Kevin, um, mm -hmm. our clergy listserv where we basically all moan and groan about how terrible life is in the Diocese of Central Florida has been full of predictions that, oh, people are never going to come back now that they've discovered the comfort of watching church in their pajamas from the lounge chair, how are we going to get them back in the pews on Sunday? Well, maybe we should just, as soon as this crisis is over, go back to the old way of doing things. Um, or is it possible? Um, where do you, what, here's, you actually know a bit or two about technology, <laughs> which I've discovered. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, thank you. Um, where, do, uh, where, do you where do you see this going in the long term? Do you think well, this is just a blip? No, this isn't a blip. This is new, and this is a new normal. Okay, the people, as we as created individuals under the living God, adapt. And we are being forced to adapt. And when we find an adaptation that, that helps us come closer to God, helps us to worship Him more, helps us to have more community, I have called Mom every day for four weeks. I haven't done that since I left for college. You know, I call her, but not every day. Now she's like, oh, it's you again. Yeah, hi, mom. I'm just making sure you're okay. We are reestablishing community. We're reestablishing the front porch mentality uh, that where we sit down and we, we listen to people. We talk to people. We're more intentional in how we interact because people out there outside our doors are dying. People outside our doors and outside our churches they're afraid of what's going on. They're afraid to talk to each other. They're afraid to get within six feet of each other. And the church is there. We're adapting. And you're going to have to understand that you, when this pandemic is over, you don't flick a switch and you're off the Internet. You've established a community. You have to keep that up. And please keep it up because it's here to serve not you, but God. It's here not to glorify you, but to glorify God. And the so. technology is so sophisticated these days. I mean, I have learned, you know, I started off my first live stream uh, with this. I followed Kevin's advice. <laughs> All right. And then we progressed to one of these. Let me, uh, other way. There you go, yeah. Uh -huh. Other way with microphones. And so I've already spent my... Uh, president's uh, twelve hundred dollars <laughs> that's already that's already on my credit card but it's only going to get better i mean i've learning i've learned my poor wife not only does she have to cook clean and fold my shirts she now has to be my producer, She's a producer. <laughs> <laughs> and okay susan fade in the scripture readings mm -hmm. fade them out okay put up the liturgy now take it down Mm -hmm. Poor woman now knows as much about the service as I do, and I've been doing it for a living for 25 years. But, well, but why I say this is it's only going to get better as as we all progress along this learning curve. No, and that's somebody true. laughing in the background. <laughs> yeah, <that's, laughs> I don't have a closed set like you do it at church. At church, there's those, you don't have to say quiet on the set. Striking in three, two, one. You know, you don't just do that here at the Carlson household. Here's what I discovered. Just a, a, a little bit of brevity in, in this chaos we live in. There are going to be a lot of people, especially in the first four weeks here, who are considering now filing for divorce. They can't handle this quarantining with their family, with their spouse. It wasn't supposed to be this bad. So they're calling lawyers, and lawyers are there all the time. You can get the 24-hour hotline to the lawyer. The lawyer's willing to fill out the paperwork and start the divorce proceedings. But you can't find a judge. You can't find a courtroom because, lo and behold, they're all shut down. By the time you do find a courtroom, you'll be used to each other finally. And you'll say, I, I don't know why we're going to get divorced. I forgot why. So the, just this original four weeks here, I, there's a lot of people right now Calling divorce lawyers, I'm sure Mrs. Anglican TV has considered it a couple times because I have to have the whole room to myself when I tape unscripted. 
but it's a new time it's a new normal we're being reintroduced to our spouses our families and to our neighbors into the world online and i've never thought that when susan when i got married to that beautiful woman when she was 22 years old and that was 35 years ago this past sunday i would see her with a pair of earphones on standing in front of me going three <laughs> two, <laughs> two <laughs> one go <laughs> <laughs> Now, oh my. The, the, the thing I love about Anglicanism is it has form and function. When we're doing the liturgy here in America, it's been done around the world the same day by all these different Anglican churches. Now around the world, in all these Anglican churches, somebody's doing the countdown. Three, two, one. Okay, we're live. And you see someone from around the pulpit. Oh, okay, we're right. All right, okay. <laughs> Welcome to our church. You know, guys, this is a great opportunity for the church. It's wonderful to see what you guys are doing. What are we coming up on here? You know, George, without Gavin, we may be doing shorter shows. It's 31 minutes. Anything else you want to talk about? Indian corruption. Or nope, that's too like long. To that's that's a okay. multi-documentary thing. Um, okay, so we got through a show with just two of us. You now understand three is better. We want you as citizens and viewers and listeners alike to recommend Anglican entities, talking heads that you would like to see appear on this program. Somebody who has some time on their hands that uh, would be a good talking head to bounce off of for Anglican Unscripted. Here's what I don't want. And this has happened a couple times. Kevin, I know this priest. He's very jovial, he's funny, and you should you should interview him or you should have him on the program. Said, great. And I, I tell me about him. Well, he doesn't really watch Unscripted. I don't think he even knows about Unscripted. That's not who we're looking for. We're looking for and, a person who's lively and knows about us. And at the same time, you know, people have mentioned, well, why don't you have N.T. Wright on? He would be wonderful. He could really give a firm Anglican theological base to, to Kevin's practical and George's historical. I just don't think he's got the time. He doesn't and, know, yeah. In yeah. other words, we're looking for people who can, if you will, slide in uh, to that sort of... Uh, oh, it's, it's four or five hours a week commitment. We do about an hour pre-show on Monday, and then we tape for an hour. If I, that's if everything's perfect, and then on Friday we do an hour uh, pre-show and we do an hour taping, and that's if everything's perfect. That's if it, all the buttons are work. That's if nobody loses their connection. Um, if everything's perfect, I need this person to have a four-hour commitment a week. Now I tell you what, the pay and benefits are really not that good either. So basically they have to work for free, they have to have four hours of free time, and they get no benefits whatsoever. And the you know there's a couple other well, weird that's things. That's not here. true. Kevin, you and your wife took Susan and me out to dinner when we were at the uh at, at the new at the new wine uh, conference in new North Wines Carolina. Games. Sure, that's right. Now when I do take co hosts out to dinner, uh that's a lot of fun we get the, the steaks we don't just get the burgers so yes the, there is a benefit you get to say you were on anglican tv that's a great benefit that's bragging rights right there i'm kevin Carlson. i'm george conger and you've been watching episode 590 of anglican unscripted